British Museum, there are many ancient artefacts that can be weighed in tons. The huge stone Hoa Hakananaya from Easter Island. And the colossal granite sculpture of the Egyptian king, Ramesses II. But in the Africa galleries, there is a bust which is not even life-size, and yet has a power equal to that of any great monument of the past. It's known as the Head of Ife. The head of Ife is three quarters life size and named after the town of Ile Ife in Nigeria, where it was dug up nearly 70 years ago. It's hollow and made of leaded brass about a centimeter thick. The head wears a crown that was originally painted red. Over the centuries, the once shining brass face has taken on a natural green patina. The head of Ife is thought to be as much as 800 years old. I think one's uh, first of all struck by the huge technical competence. So it's a major craftsman, a major skill, whoever it was produced that. But more than that, it was someone with a sensitivity to form and shape. Um, and the, the head has great humanity, great presence. It is a wonderful object. The first reaction that everyone has looking at this head is um, just an astonishment first. Surprise, it's beautiful. It's casting at a very high level. It's a very beautiful object. It's ancient, it's enigmatic. In the whole African tradition of art as we know it, it has a certain uniqueness. There isn't very much else like that. Um, it's, it's just a very, a very powerful, mysterious object that, that one is drawn to again and again. The head of Ife raises many intriguing questions. What, for instance, is the significance of the elaborate headdress and the scarring on the face? Why are there holes around the mouth and running along the cheekbone to the ears? Why are there more holes in the neck and the temple? And what function did this sculpture serve? It was at the end of the 19th century that Europeans first began to take a serious interest in the art of Africa. In 1897, over 2,000 works of art were removed from Benin City in Nigeria after the city was destroyed by British troops. The Benin bronzes stunned Europeans who saw them. People worried long and hard about the Benin bronzes. Could they really have been made by Africans? Were they actually made by Portuguese for them? Uh, we now know, of course, that they were made by Africans, and that casting tradition stretches back long, long before European influence. But at the time, they changed, very importantly, our preconceptions about what African art was and what Africans were like. But the people who made these majestic sculptures, dating from the 16th to the 19th century, were relative newcomers in the art and craft of casting metal. Their oral traditions told them that they had learned their skills from the Yoruba people of Ife, about a hundred miles away to the northwest. In fact, this Benin bronze of a man on horseback has been interpreted as a metalsmith from Ife, bringing the knowledge of casting techniques to the people of Benin. In modern times, the first awareness in the world outside Nigeria of a unique and distinctive art of Ife came in the early years of the 20th century. 
a German anthropologist, Leo Frobenius, led an expedition to West Africa and visited Ife. For a few weeks in 1910, Frobenius carried out excavations and unearthed many terracotta and stone heads. But he was also shown a brass head, which he was told was Olokun, the Yoruba god of the sea. He photographed it for his book, The Voice of Africa. It bears a striking resemblance to the head of Ife in the British Museum. Closer to me is the cast of the head which uh, Leo Frobenius was shown in 1910, uh, which is called the Olokun head. And the second is the original head, which is in the British Museum. As you can see, both heads are done according to the same aesthetic traditions. The treatment of, of the face, uh, the nose, the lips are made in the same way. The treatment of the, the ethnic marks are the same also on the, on the face. They indicate the same tradition of producing brass heads. The sight of the brass Olokun head threw Leo Frobenius into a state of utter confusion. He simply couldn't believe that the people of Ife had ever been capable of making such a sophisticated object. In 1910, it was generally thought that African sculpture was extremely unrealistic, uh, savage heads, the sort of thing that Picasso was inspired by. That was thought to be the way Africans carved. Um, and to find uh, in Ife a head which rivaled in accomplishment the finest naturalism of the Greek Elgin marbles or whatever was a huge surprise. And people thought, well, that's not how Africans carved. Uh, uh, Africans don't make naturalistic sculpture. Naturalism is the high point of civilization, and they refuse to believe that Africans themselves did this. Frobenius came up with a novel suggestion to explain the existence of the sculptures he discovered in Ife. Frobenius said, well, it must be that this was a, a, a Greek civilization, and even went so far as to say that uh, it was proof that Atlantis existed, and this was the remains of a Greek colony of however many centuries earlier than that. Frobenius's flight of fancy in thinking that in Ife he had stumbled upon the remains of Atlantis shed little light on the Yoruba tradition of metal casting. Today, Ife is a sprawling city of half a million people. There were more treasures to come from beneath the soil of this ancient place. In January 1938, a man started digging the foundations for a new house in this compound, not far from the royal palace of the king, or Oni of Ife. As the work progressed on this site, a total of 18 sculptures were unearthed. Many were lying just a few feet below the surface, and one of them was the head now in the British Museum. We can really say that the Ife metal heads were discovered twice. They were discovered for the first time by Frobenius in, in 1910. That was somehow forgotten. And then they were rediscovered again in the late 1930s and once more caused a sensation. This sensational and unexpected new find was reported with great enthusiasm by an American anthropologist, William Bascom, for the Illustrated London News. Such was the high quality of the work that he likened the unknown people who made them to the great Italian Renaissance sculptor Donatello. He wrote, Little that Italy, Greece or Egypt ever produced could be finer, and the appeal of their beauty is immediate and universal. Most of the heads unearthed in 1938 remained with the Oni of Ife. These are casts of some of them held in the British Museum collection. The sight of such a large group of refined naturalistic work 
had a profound effect on Europeans, but the idea still persisted that they couldn't be the work of Africans. In his article, William Bascom wrote, how in a comparatively obscure corner of this vast and backward continent could an art and a technique have flowered that take their stand beside the best ever evolved by the elaborate civilizations of Europe and Asia? You know, old stereotypes die hard. And in spite of the discoveries of Frobenius in 1910, and in spite of the Benin brass castings from 1897, people still had this view of African art as schematic wood sculpture, rather jagged and angular and sort of unlifelike and all the rest of it. So placed in the context of African art, this head had the effect of forcing Europeans to expand their view of what could be considered art in Africa. <laughs> It wasn't just that Europeans couldn't believe that Africans had the artistic sensibility to create such an object as the head of Ife. They couldn't believe either that Africans had the technological know-how to cast it. The head of Ife was made using the lost wax process, now known to have been practiced in West Africa for centuries before the first Europeans set foot there. The artist would have started with a clay core um, probably with some animal dung, perhaps some cereal husk in there as well. Once the clay core was modelled into a roughly human head shape, sheets of beeswax would have been modelled onto that of a known thickness. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of the ephah heads are cast incredibly finely. So the, the thinness of the, of the wax, which was probably also a relatively valuable material, would have been important. And this would have been modelled to, to give all the detail that the final metal casting should have. Having done that, he would enclose the whole wax and structure with this same clay dung sand mixture, very carefully pushed into all the detail that was in the head. And it's how well he pushes the mixture into the wax, how well the, the, the bronze will actually cast. The clay surround with the head inside would then have been heated and the wax melted out. In the traditional lost wax process, molten metal is then poured into the space that's been left. But the head of Ife has a secret. It was probably cast using a variation of this technique. The open pouring of metal tends to be a much later development in Africa. The early West African tradition seems to all have been the enclosed crucible. So what the Ife artist would have done is he would have attached these casting channels, rods of wax, and they would have come to a cup at the top. But in West Africa, they actually put the chips of metal into this space here. They then put an old shard of pottery over the top to protect it and enclose the whole mold like that so that the metal was already enclosed in the mold. The mold could then be put in a fire, the wax melted out of it and with a little drain hole that's there drains all the wax out, that gets plugged and then the fire's built up in temperature until all these little chips of metal here melt and they flow down into the space where the wax was and fill it up and hey presto you've got your bronze. The general quality of the casting is, 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 is quite, quite excellent. Um, the metal clearly flowed through all the parts of the mould, including the intricacies of the details on the headdress or crown. And more especially, where you look at this, it really is just a one-piece, one-off casting with very little in the way of necessary repairs afterwards, where the metal didn't flow or the mould collapsed or something like that, which honestly is a very common fault. Um, you know, if you have a look at the, your average Greek or Roman equivalent um, bronze head,